chronic stress could be quietly sabotaging your metabolism, one cortisol spike at a time, resulting in fatigue, weight gain, mood instability, and eventually type 2 diabetes. Keep watching to discover how high cortisol causes insulin resistance and learn how to break the cycle using evidence-based functional medicine strategies. According to recent evidence, one out of every three Americans is insulin resistant. A 2021 study found that even young adults are impacted. 40% of study participants age 18 to 44 had insulin resistance and were at significantly higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease. Yes, the standard American diet is at least partly to blame, but I've met plenty of folks in my decade plus of practice who make great food choices, get plenty of exercise, and still find themselves battling insulin resistance. That's why we're going to unpack the connection between chronic stress, specifically elevated cortisol, and the development of insulin resistance. Because let's face it, stress is both very real and very present in our lives, and it does very real damage if you let it. But before we can connect the dots between cortisol and insulin resistance, I need you to understand some basics, starting with the function of insulin and what goes wrong to put you in an insulin resistant state. Insulin is made by the islet of Langerhans cells in your pancreas, and it does two main things in the body. It acts as a hormone to help manage blood sugar levels, and it signals your cells to take in energy in the form of glucose. When you eat carbohydrates, your digestive tract breaks them down into sugars and transports them into your bloodstream. This makes your blood glucose rise, signaling the pancreas to release insulin. Insulin then helps bring blood glucose levels back down by telling cells how to use the glucose to send it to various tissues as energy or to store it as fat. Insulin resistance happens when your blood glucose remains consistently elevated, when the pancreas is constantly stimulated to release insulin, and when the receptors for insulin on your cells are less responsive or sensitive to insulin stimulation. How can you tell if you're insulin resistant? A few early signs of insulin resistance include fatigue, feeling shaky or lightheaded, especially if you haven't eaten in a while, cravings for sweets or carbs, headaches, hanger, <laughs> brain fog, weight gain, or trouble losing excess body fat. But even though most folks with insulin resistance struggle to maintain a healthy body weight, you can still have insulin resistance even if you're not overweight or obese. Thankfully, early and comprehensive lab testing can help you figure out if your body is struggling to respond appropriately to insulin. If you have fasting insulin levels above 10 microinternational units over milliliter, hemoglobin A1c above 5.6%, or if your blood sugar takes too long to return to baseline during a glucose tolerance test, you're most likely insulin resistant. Eventually, insulin resistance turns into type 2 diabetes, chronic inflammation, elevated cholesterol, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, and nerve damage. So if you're seeing elevations in any of these labs, the time to make changes is now, before they get worse. You might be wondering, okay, Dr. Kate, what do stress hormones have to do with insulin and blood sugar? Well, cortisol, your long-term stress hormone, is a glucocorticoid, meaning that by its very nature, it uses sugar and fat to mediate a response. More on that in a second. Cortisol is released in response to a perceived stressor, which your brain and body interpret as a threat to your survival, even if it's not. For example, a few years ago, I had the privilege of speaking at a conference, ironically, on the topic of building stress resilience. I was well prepared, I'd given the presentation several times before, and I generally enjoy teaching in this setting. But one of my teachers was in the audience, and my brain decided that if I made a mistake in front of my teacher, the world was going to end. Was I in real danger? Of course not. But try telling that to a freaked out stress response system. It's about perception. 
If your brain interprets something as a threat, your body follows right along. Once the brain perceives that stressor, it activates the release of adrenaline, the stress hormone that wakes up and mobilizes the body to act, which triggers the fight-flight-freeze response. It also signals to the hypothalamus in the brain, which relays that signal to the pituitary, which then tells the adrenal glands to produce and release cortisol. We call this the HPA axis. Now, here's what happens next. While adrenaline can make you feel shaky and agitated, cortisol is initially calming. It's there to take the edge off adrenaline in the short term and to promote focus, strength, and improved pain tolerance. Cortisol is there to help you manage the problem and neutralize the threat effectively. And that includes making changes to your energy utilization. Because the goal of cortisol is survival, it keeps glucose easily available in the bloodstream in case you need it to run from the threat. It does this using a few strategies, all of which are helpful when your stress is short-term, but become a problem if stress, and therefore cortisol, fails to return to baseline. Cortisol blocks insulin receptors from binding to insulin. This means that less glucose is taken up into your cells and more is floating around in your bloodstream. Too much glucose in your blood causes inflammation and damage to your blood vessels, playing a role in the formation of atherosclerotic plaques, which can obstruct or weaken your blood vessels and cause a stroke or a heart attack. Cortisol also induces a process in the liver called gluconeogenesis. If you break down that word, you may be able to guess what this means. Gluco or glucose, neo or new, genesis or formation. Cortisol causes new glucose or sugar to be made and released into circulation by the liver, elevating blood sugar levels. This can be a good thing if you're encountering a threat because it provides more fuel for your cells. But if that threat is chronic and you're not able to burn off that extra glucose by running away from the stressor, it becomes a bad thing, especially for your waistline. When blood glucose is elevated but not utilized, it is eventually stored as fat, especially in the midsection. Some of that belly fat may be distributed around the viscera, underneath the abdominal muscles, packed around your intestines, lymph nodes, blood vessels, and other organs in the abdominal cavity. This is called visceral adipose tissue, and it significantly increases your risk for developing diseases like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Not only does cortisol ramp up this process, it diverts the healthy protein that you eat away from cellular repair and muscle building and towards gluconeogenesis. As if this wasn't bad enough, cortisol also breaks down fatty acids to make more glucose. When cortisol is elevated, it hijacks your brain, digestive system, and endocrine system with the express goal of keeping your blood glucose high, all because your brain perceived a threat or a stressor. This is a really important point, and it's one of the reasons why some folks can eat really, really well, focusing on protein and healthy fats and avoiding high glycemic carbs and sugars and still become insulin resistant. Cortisol is king, and in the long run, elevated cortisol causes an increase in belly fat, fatigue, GI issues, increased blood pressure, sex hormone imbalances, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease all because your body is stuck in chronic stress mode. So let's say you're noticing some of the signs and symptoms of insulin resistance in yourself. How can you tell if cortisol is causing or contributing to it? Well, there's a test for that, and it isn't a blood test. Because cortisol levels vary greatly throughout a normal wake-sleep cycle, unless you're getting your blood drawn five times in a day to check cortisol, it isn't very helpful. Of course, if your cortisol level is very high or very low on a random blood draw, it can indicate more severe diseases like Addison's disease or Cushing syndrome, both of which are quite rare. But most folks with higher or lower than optimal cortisol don't have tumors or autoimmune destruction of the adrenal glands. They're stuck in survival mode or have exhausted their stress response system. It is possible to test free cortisol using saliva, and lots of people do. This method shows you your cortisol curve through the day and night, 
and helps you visualize spikes and crashes associated with different symptoms. But free cortisol can be deceiving. I've seen folks with normal free cortisol whose total cortisol production is extremely high, or the reverse can happen too. In order to get an overall measure of total cortisol production, I suggest utilizing a comprehensive at-home test called the Dutch Adrenal. It measures your urine for cortisol metabolites that parallel salivary levels, so you can see both free and overall levels of cortisol. You also get measurements of DHEA, another adrenal hormone that is integral for the production of certain reproductive hormones. I'll put a link to more information about the Dutch adrenal test, including how you can order your own test kit, in the video description. We help people all over the world access this testing, and I'll even help you interpret it. All of this may feel like some seriously bad news, especially if you have unrelenting, unavoidable stress in your life. But there are evidence-based strategies you can use to both lower elevated cortisol levels and treat or prevent insulin resistance using functional medicine. I'm going to share a bunch of my favorites with you, including my recommended supplements and nutraceuticals for calming cortisol and balancing blood sugar. And just so you know, links to the specifics on these suggestions can be found in the video description, so be sure to check that out after we're done. Because cortisol is integrated with your circadian rhythm, maintaining a healthy sleep-wake cycle is a really important strategy for regulating both cortisol and insulin. Cortisol loves routine, particularly a healthy sleep routine. Aim to go to bed at the same time every night and wake up at the same time every morning. And try to get enough sleep too. I know this can be particularly difficult when you're already under a lot of stress, but it's really important. Speaking of routine, another way you can help balance cortisol and blood sugar is to eat something with protein, healthy fat, and fiber every two to four hours during the day. This helps avoid blood sugar spikes and crashes, which helps soothe your jumpy cortisol levels as well. You can still fast overnight when your body is in rest and digest mode, but extended fasting during the day when stress is high can contribute to elevated cortisol if you're not careful. And while you're establishing these healthy sleep and eating routines, why not make a habit of taking a walk after a meal? A 20-minute stroll after eating helps encourage healthy digestion, minimizing bloating, heartburn, and reflux. It also burns energy, helping trigger your muscles to take up glucose and lower postprandial levels in the blood. A nice walk even helps you breathe more fully, which lowers cortisol levels. That's why mindfulness practice and yoga have such great evidence in their favor as well. When it comes to herbal supports, my favorite way to promote insulin sensitivity is berberin. If you've been hanging around this channel for a little bit, you'll have seen my other videos on berberin's effectiveness for everything from balancing the microbiome to helping you drop unwanted body fat. According to a 2012 meta-analysis of 14 different studies, including more than 1,000 people, berberin was able to help with blood sugar control as much as the common diabetes medication metformin. I'll put a link to my preferred berberin supplement in the video description. And if you order through my link, you'll get a really nice discount too. For nutraceuticals that lower cortisol itself, you have lots of options. And you can find several of them in my cortisol calming trio. A unique peptide called casein triptych hydroxylate, which is derived from cow's milk, has been shown in one study to lower cortisol by 20% in just five minutes when taken in supplement form. Adaptogens like ashwagandha, holy basil, and bacopa work together to lower cortisol levels over time by influencing the brain, other hormones, and even the immune system. Holy basil is especially good at normalizing blood sugar levels too. And if your circadian rhythm is off, my favorite sleep support nutraceutical focuses more on lowering cortisol specifically than sedating you to sleep. It also includes ashwagandha, L-theanine, magnolia, and phosphatidylcholine to calm the mind and lower cortisol quickly after the very first use. It helps you fall asleep faster and stay asleep, and it's non-habit forming, so you can safely take it every night. The best part is that this formula also reduces stress symptoms during the day. Again, you can find all of these supports in my free Cortisol Calming Trio user guide, 
You can sign up for the download via the link in the video description for more details on each support, including dose, timing, and other helpful tips, including how to grab them at a nice discount. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful and informative, but most of all, I hope it provides you with some actionable strategies that you can use to reduce your symptoms and even prevent future problems. If you're looking for more options, I'd highly recommend signing up for my YouTube membership by clicking the join button. You'll get instant access to an exclusive library of in-depth webinars, tutorials, and trainings, including the Stress Smarter Mini Workshop, a three-part series all about cortisol, chronic stress, and practical strategies for resolving HPA axis imbalances. There's also a deep dive about hormones in there that you might like, so be sure to check it out. Thanks again for your support. Your likes, subscribes, and encouraging comments really mean a lot. I guess that about wraps it up, so I'll see you in the next video.